We're going to start off with um, the student group reporting out and what they've been doing, and we're going to build up with a couple announcements. There's going to be some break. The food probably breaks out around, let's see, according to this, the food will be available about 4.30, and then uh, we'll have our feature, featured speaker, and afterwards there's a little 30-minute small group brainstorm activity at your tables. All right, Amanda, welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. I'm the recently elected president of the HEI student org this semester. And we're just going to do a quick overview of what we have going on this spring for activities. So first, this is our wonderful exec board right now. Um, and as a plug, we'll be running elections for next year pretty soon. So if you're thinking about getting more involved, please consider signing up for uh, or applying for a position. So for spring semester, this is just a quick overview. I'll go through each of them. So first of all, we had a social last Friday. Unfortunately, we also had tornadoes in the state of Iowa last Friday. So I didn't make it, but I'm told there was pretty low attendance, unfortunately. Um, so there's a nice picture of a, a previous social. <laughs> we'll try again in the fall and hopefully have no tornadoes this time. And then upcoming on Tuesday of this coming week, we're excited to be hosting Karen from Career Services. She's going to be giving a talk about um, basically how to find a job in HCI and looking at it from an interdisciplinary um, focus. So we don't really fit into College of Engineering, College of Design, we're right in the middle. So how can we, how do you manage the career fairs? How do you look on LinkedIn for jobs when there's so many different job titles for UX? Um, so she's going to talk about that whole topic and it should be really good. So please join that. I did send out an email so you should all have something from me in your inbox if you uh, need help finding that, let me know and I can resend the invitation. That will be both in person as well as there being a Zoom session. And it will also be recorded and Tiffany's going to help us make that recording available online afterwards. The one other event we have coming up this spring is Ezekiel is planning an outreach event on May 20th for a group of middle schoolers. And I don't know very much about this thing, but he told me they'll be using this cool cube thing looks like augmented reality. I don't really know, but it looks cool. Um, so if you're interested in helping out and volunteering that day, talk to Ezekiel. The last thing I wanted to talk about is the Usability-thon, which is an annual event. Um, it is going to be postponed to fall this year, just with the timing of when I came into the org and getting things rolling. We didn't feel like there was enough time to put a good event, to get sponsors, to give people time to form teams and really be ready. So we're going to make it a fall event this year. We're looking in potentially late October on one of the weekends when there is not a home football game. And that's really all I have. Pretty short and sweet. If you have any questions for me, let me know. Otherwise, we can move on to the next topic. Thank you. So our official next topic is the um, faculty introductions. And uh, what's exciting is that some of them don't even know each other. <laughs> so they can meet each other. But before I do that, I do want to point out that this uh, retreat is possible because of the amazing VRAC staff. So the VRAC staff can stand up briefly. We have Sarah. Sarah, wave, Sarah. <laughs> and um, St Steve Hoopengarner. Yes. And Steve is new. Some of the faculty may not have met Steve yet, but he knows everything about your money and can, and can help you out. And uh, you, need have, you have questions about your budgets, and Steve will help you out. Uh, uh, many, every, almost everybody here knows Tiffany. Tiffany Kaiser, yes. <laughs> who has, this past year, won several awards and accolades from people appreciating her customer service and efficiency. So you know it personally, and now it's been awarded. Uh, Glenn Galvin, running the operations of the staff IT, <laughs> along with Paul Isker next door. Yeah. So thank you. And just in time, it's Lynn, Lynn Bagley. Yes, thank you, Lynn. The VREC mom, as she says. Uh, it's nice to have her a good center to have a mom. I think center is a place where faculty share expensive equipment and students meet each other from across projects. And that is, and there, it's only possible because of what they're doing. So thank you for the enormous effort and do the food. And they also have laid out all the paper you're about to play with later. So thank you. 
Okay, so faculty, we've got some faculty uh, slides. You know, faculty members are paid to talk, and that's dangerous. Uh, so we're gonna try to do one minute intros. And so the idea is if you see a slide that you're, you know, say your name and why you're part, of, why you like being part of HCI. And if you don't have a slide in here, we can, uh, you know, ad hoc, but if you, this is a test of whether you read your email. And okay, EJ, are you here? Is EJ here? EJ is not here, I think. Um, EJ, Evren, would you want to stand to say something about EJ? Yeah, yeah, she's my dear friend. <laughs> EJ is an associate professor in the School of Education, and um, we work on projects with STEM education, science education. She's an expert on physics education as well. She's actually the, the equity advisor for the College of Human Sciences, so really interested in DEI efforts. Um, yeah, she works around mentoring programs, community practices, culture, gender, society in relation to science. Feel free to reach out to her. <laughs> Information. Yes. I was using my teacher voice. <laughs> It just happens that they've coordinated well in the School of Education and Evren Baran yes, is next. that's me. My slide's from last year, so sorry I didn't update. Um, so I do work around design, development, and evaluation of educational technology. Uh, I have several NSF projects um, on classroom analytics, classroom sensing technologies, as well as STEM education. I am an alumni of this program, so <laughs> I'm a special faculty. I love this program. It gives me a lot of opportunities to interact with students from different disciplines, to projects with my colleagues in different departments. So it's it's great to be here. Thank you. Next we have. Um, well, uh, so as much as we want to applaud for everyone, I'm going to hold the applause till everybody talks, so it'll go faster. So. <laughs> Uh, Jan Boyles said she could not make it, but I want to represent Jan is in uh, Greenlee School of Economics. She's very excited about HCI. She works a lot with um, things like social media and the data in social media. She used to work for the Pew Forum, uh, which is you, you may know is sort of a reliable source of information about American culture. Uh, and so she's always excited to be on committees. So students, look for her if you'd like. Uh, Yong Yong Cho could also not be here. Um, who have we got in design? Cheng Di, do you know about Yong Yun enough to represent? Mm. Okay, so uh, you've got, uh, he's very excited. He's a little more uh, computational version of interior design, so talk to him if you're interested in that. Um, microphone to Michael. All right, so I'm Michael Dornike. Uh, so I'm in industrial manufacturing systems engineering, and so I'm uh, very much from the engineering side of human factors, so I like to build technology, especially technology that is really smart and can act on its own. What are all the human factors issues when you have agents with uh, more and more capabilities working with humans? And that could be in any domain. Could be in aviation, could be in education, could be, uh, could be all kinds of things. And uh, you asked why do I like working with HCI? Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of schools and universities talk about being interdisciplinary and how they support it, but then, you know, all their structures are department, department, department. And, and through this program, I can not only advise uh, industrial engineering students, but I can advise students from all over campus, and the structures are there, and it's as easy as pie. And so I have a much richer uh, research group because I can basically recruit from all of you. So. Thank you. Uh. I'll stick with this one. Um, so Pete Evans is uh, around. He does exist, uh, despite this slide. Uh, he's in design. Uh, he works a lot with um, virtual reality for architecture and this sort of thing. And he does have a Varjo headset, which is admirable because they're about $6,000 each. So they're fun to play with. And he's collaborating on some eye tracking studies right now. Uh, Carmen. All right, so I'm Carmen Gomez. I'm a mechanical, mechanical engineering department associate professor. I'm also the equity advisor of the College of Engineering. So I do a lot of work related to diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in serving in a lot of um, roles for the, the college. But my research is related to uh, development of sensors. So uh, I do the device, and I really appreciate the HCI pro part component because I get to understand how hard it is to operate them and how to make them easier to use and hopefully easier also to uh, be implemented and adopted by society. So develop different types of sensors from 
applications in soil, in food, and also uh, measuring um, human health factors, so biomarkers and, and things like that related to saliva, urine, you name it, any food that we can collect from body, we can do it. So in a nutshell, that is what I do, but I also do some encapsulation work. But giving my time, I won't do much <laughs> talking. I will pass for the Thank next you. person. Thank Please. you. Thank you. Um, I, need to go. I guess we should talk. OK. Let's pass it to uh, Chris Harding. Hi, I'm Chris Harding. I'm an associate professor in geology, or geological and atmospheric sciences, as we are still called. We will change that eventually. Um, I am primarily interested in uh, two things. I teach a lot of GIS for the geoscientists, and because of that, I got into modeling 3D terrain. And at one point, somebody said, wouldn't it be cool if you could print it out and take it in the field and show our students where they're actually running around? Uh, and so that's what I've been doing over the last couple of years. Uh, I have a printer that can use uh, produce very large uh, 400 by 400 uh, the models, so, uh, which is great for students who want to basically use it as a 3D map in the field. And I'm currently running a Miller project um, about actually gathering data, how well students perform, how they like it, and uh, you know, do they learn spatial skills by using rather the, you know, this type of virtual reality than a paper map, which we still have them do. Um, the other major role I have is that I teach a lot of GIS, uh, sorry, um, Python related classes uh, for the EHCR program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go, can you pass it back to Elliot back there? And we're good on the slide for Baywin Lee. So hi, I'm not Baywin. Um, no, so those are words of Baywin, I, I've mentioned him for a lot of years. He's phenomenal. Um, he does really cool optical sensing. If you're in the dabble area of the center, you'll see a bunch of big optical tables and cameras and stuff. Um, so what you're looking at, like in the lower left there, he can create meshes and images in real time. Um, he can have an animation while you're talking be shining on your face, and there's the mesh model over you talking in real time. So he can scan a lot of different things. Um, and he works on how you deal with reflective surfaces, things like that, and then obviously how do you have HCI interfaces to that. So he's, uh, he, he went from, you know, in a very short period of time to having more funding and students that he knows what to do with, but absolutely ask him to collaborate with you because he's great to work with. Hi, I'm Kristen Yvonne Rosier. Um, I, I emailed you my research areas, but I guess I didn't get in there. Oh. So my research is in formal methods, which contrary to popular belief does not mean I do math while wearing a tuxedo. It means that I create formal automated mathematical proofs that safety critical systems behave the way we expect them to. And uh, formal methods are amazing and required for certification of a lot of aerospace systems, which is why I'm in aerospace. Um, but the major Achilles heel of formal methods is that you have to be able to describe these systems and their safety properties in a mathematical way so that you can create proofs. And that is a very difficult thing for a lot of humans to do. And you also have to be able to take the output from formal methods and relate them back to the system in an intuitive way for certification. So that's where a lot of my HCI-related research comes in. She did send me a slide. I can attest to that. I'm sorry about that. Um, we'll get that out when, before we send it out to everybody. Okay. Um, Max Shelley is not here. He's an incredible uh, brain of knowledge on politics and statistics. If you ever want to see a long CV, look at his CV. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> so long. And he's uh, very generous with his time and with students. Students can contact him with all sorts of questions. He's a great guy to work with. Um, ben. Hi all, I'm uh, Ben Van Dusen. I'm science education faculty in the School of Education and uh, I tend to look at issues of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM learning. I also do a lot of work with large scale um, data collection, thinking about assessments, um, working on building a computer adaptive, or sorry, a cognitive diagnostic computer adaptive test right now, working with the physics department. Um, and yeah, oh, one thing I love to do one of my major research interests is thinking about the way our quantitative methods 
shape our findings, particularly around issues of equity, where a lot of times we think about quantitative methods as just being, it's just the numbers, but we make a lot of decisions um, that can bias our findings. So unearthing uh, the impacts of those and thinking about the ways we might be able to do things better methodologically is a thing I spend a lot of time thinking about. Thank you. I really like this idea of the hidden human pieces and all the engineering and the math. Um, Cindy Wiley cannot be here with us tonight. Um, they are uh, a, a lead on campus for digital accessibility, which is exciting. Uh, I was talking with Kristen Constant, our CIO, about the Digital Accessibility Center, and it had, uh, before COVID, it had 50 visitors per day. You know, and so this is, this is uh, all the assistive technologies you might ever want for somebody who has disabilities of different kinds, uh, to promote reading uh, online for remote students with different disabilities. And um, so it's very exciting. And Cindy is also an alum from this program. OK, Elliot. So this is me, uh, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, Director of the VRAC. Hopefully you all knew that. If you didn't, hi, I'm the director. Um, so I do a lot of work in extended reality, machine learning. Um, we've done medical imaging. It hasn't done it for a while. Hopefully getting back into that big data, vision analytics. So all the you know, a lot of the high tech stuff. So if you need simulation built, you need data analyzed, whatever, come and see me. We'll, we'll, we'll try and slot you in. And, but I'm always willing to work with people. And also for just in general, because um, I've been here be my 20th year now. So if you want to work with people, you want you need to have a need for something, you don't know who it is. Even if it's not me, come to me, come to Steven. That's part of our job you know, as director and associate director is to get you connected up with the right people so we can get, uh, more, get your work done, get more work done through the center. OK, thanks. While you're there, you want to say Kimberly? Don't do what? Sure, I can do Kimberly. So um, we, we uh, so everyone and I and Kimberly work a lot together. So Kimberly is a new addition to actually being housed in the center, right? So if you're actually walk down the hall, past my office, past Stephen's office, and Cody and them, you're, she's she's now on the way to Glen. Um, she's a professor in architecture um, and does a lot of really cool work. So I, although she's a professor in architecture, she does a lot of really cool work in rural communities. I can't even begin to tell you, um, she told us how many times ever, and I still can't remember, but she goes to like Eastern Europe all the time because her degree, like she doesn't, yeah, Slovak, she speaks like Slavic languages and things like that, and you're kind of like, how's that professor of architecture? I don't really understand either, so definitely go ask her that. Um, but her research interests really are looking at things in like uh, rural communities like rural Iowa, like even really tiny communities like 500 to 1,000. We all know they're bleeding population like crazy, but our food, energy, water systems are so critical to rural areas, right? I mean, we're not setting up massive solar arrays in New York City. We're setting them up in where we have tons of land. And if everybody's leaving, who's going to take care of those? And how's that going to help evaluate? So she looks at, you know, what are the issues and obstacles for those kind of things? How can we get people that want to stay there, be able to stay there, but get higher paying jobs, still get education, still get trained, uh, using high-end technology, social capital, things like that to make that happen? I'm going to go to Penn. Hi, um, my name is Song Ping Ye. I go by Ping. I'm the. Uh... Sorry, I don't have a slide. Oh, you don't have a slide? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a slide. I almost forgot my title. <laughs> I'm the, uh, the associate teaching professor. I only teach one course a year uh, related to virtual reality, augmented reality, and computer graphics. So you may ask why I'm doing my time in the spare time. I'm the software development manager at Siemens, still focusing on uh, research related to industrial metaverse. And you ask why I love HCI. I graduated from VREC 25 years ago. So VREC and HCI always feel like family member to me. So that's the, the why I come back to teach this class. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Good Mary. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Fornoff. I'm from Human Communication. I'm housed in the psychology department, but at most of my course load here is teaching undergraduate students uh, group dynamics and nonverbal communication. So I come from the world of groups and interpersonal communication, and in particular, I'm interested in influence, so ways in which we structure messaging to influence each other through face-to-face uh, -face context and computer-mediated context. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go to Ritwick in front of you here. Hi, I'm Ritwick Banerjee. I'm an assistant professor of anthropology. Um, I also teach a design ethnography class for the HCI program. Uh, a lot of my work is based in the idea of using ethnographic methods as a way of 
designing as a basis for designing systems that fit well with human uh, practices. Uh, I'm also a media artist. I design artificially intelligent virtual improvisers, uh, and I'm also uh, a game designer. I build um, video games where the con only control structure is uh, sound. And so, uh, one of the reasons why I like being in HCI is because anthropologists don't understand or care about what I do, uh, and people in this room actually do. So, thank you for doing that. Thank you. All right, let's get to Chengdei back here. Uh, I'm Cheng Di Wu from Ar Architecture Department. Um, my work er uh, the, the, um, my research area is about environmental uh, technology, like uh, thermal comfort, daylight, things like that. I work a lot with uh, simulation, like energy simulation, stuff like that. I also work with um, environmental sensors uh, for smart buildings. Uh, as for why I'm in this uh, HCI group is other than the relevance of my work with HCI. I just uh, like to hang out with the uh, cool people. That's right. <laughs> I'm John Kelly, and I'm a professor in psychology. Um, and my research is at the intersection of psychological cognitive processes, like perception and memory and virtual reality. So understanding virtual reality from kind of a user perspective, what are the human capabilities and limitations uh, psychologically. Uh, my favorite thing about HCI is teaching HCI 521, Cognitive Psychology of HCI. I get to interact with just all of you. Um, great diverse students and uh, lots of different backgrounds and ideas and goals. Um, it's a lot of fun for me. So, thanks. Hey everybody, I'm Alex Toichev. I'm an associate professor in uh, electrical and computer engineering. And for the graduate students in the room, I teach the computational perception class, so maybe some of you are taking it this semester. Uh, my research is in uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, and also signal processing. Um, the cool thing about HCI, as many of my colleagues said, is that it's a unique intersection between multiple disciplines on campus. Uh, I don't know of any other place that can do this. And this is why I, I like this program. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm Kimberly Zarekor, also from architecture. Sorry to be late. Um, I am new to HCI. I will be teaching a research methods class in the fall for the first time. That's actually HCI cross-listed. So nice to see everyone. I missed any other faculty. I don't want to miss anybody. Okay. I thought I did. Maybe I've got the wrong version. I ran out of time. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I had a slide for him. Anyway, I'm Charlie Kostelnik from the English Department. I work in the Rhetoric and Professional Communication Program as well as uh, Technical Communication. My main research interests are in the rhetoric of visual communication and visual design, and most specifically to HCI, I'm interested in. Uh, the rhetoric of interactive data visualization. For example, uh, the ability of users to customize data, to kind of see data in their own neighborhoods and the emotional uh, responses that that engenders, uh, as well as some of the new perceptual uh, um, design elements that interactivity bring to the table. I'm also interested in visual com conventions uh, and uh, specifically in charts and graphs and how interactive data design draws from that history of charts and graphs, but also reinvents uh, some of the older forms uh, that uh, were uh, present in the past uh, but lost their way historically. So uh, anything that has to do with visual design I'm interested in. So I can blame the HCI of Box for not having the updated slide deck, I guess. Because I know we had your slide, we had your slide, yeah. Okay, I think we've got all the faculty introduced. I hope that's um, useful. We are gonna take, at this point, which? <laughs> Myself, oh, I'm Steven. Um, I, uh, let's see, I came to Iowa State in 2007 and um, Taught the five, taught HCI 521 for one year before John was found, right? Or put on that course and did a much better job, I'm sure. Uh, 
and I'm excited to be here, have been running the REU site in the summers with Elliot, which is sort of an undergrad little outreach, grab the undergrads and make them think HCI. And um, yeah, I just love the interdisciplinary work and there's so much need for HCI everywhere. So yeah, that's why you're here for me. Um, so we're, we're supposed to have, thank you. Um, according to our time. Uh, we're going to have a 10-minute break where you can get food and snacks. And so then we're going to come back in 10 minutes, and we're going to hear from Elliot for five minutes, from me on the grad program for 10 minutes, and then our speaker. Okay, 10-minute break for food. Go talk to somebody you just saw introduced. Don't make me flick the lights on and off in the classroom, boys and girls. Shh. All right. Um, so I just have a couple of updates just about the center uh, in general. So some changes, right? We've got new paint. We've got new carpet. That's it? Do you have any idea what I had to go through? So suffice to say, I'm probably going to quit now because nothing I'm ever going to do is going to be better than new paint, new carpet, let's be honest. I mean, you talk to Jim Oliver, we fought for 20 years. To, to get new paint, new carpet, so it's been a battle. Um, we have a new name. We're no longer the Virtual Reality Application Center, right? Uh, so just so some of you might be like, why did you do what you did? I, we were not, I was not allowed to get rid of VRAC. I wanted to get rid of, v, not get rid of VRAC, but the VRAC, we were not allowed to, okay? The provost, a friend of mine, said, look, you can't do it. So that was why we came up with visualize, reason, analyze, collaborate. If you don't like it, I don't care. Um, I'll just be honest with you. But it is what you see in a lot of marketing nowadays, right? IBM is no longer international business machines. SGI is no longer Silicon Graphics. They're SGI, they're IBM. So we're kind of going along that trend. You're going to see more coming out about that. We got a new mission, we got a new vision statement, new website is coming. Logo contest, if you, who, who has not voted? Oh, you're such liars. You didn't want to put your hand up. But get your votes in by Monday. We're going to have a new logo. Um, so then we'll get the new website out. A poster competition, you all heard about that. We are going to wait, hold off on that and do that in the fall. Just some things, and a lot of it was on me and other people. There's been so much going on. We just want to make sure everything's all set. We'll have a logo and a template. We'll do it in the fall, early fall. So we'll have some empty walls in the center for a couple more months. It doesn't matter, but I want everybody, please, I'm going to really lean on the faculty to make sure your groups come out with some posters. My group, I have mandated that at least three posters are coming out of my research group, if not more. They're all mad at me, but I don't care that they're going to do that. Um, we also have two new scientist positions that we just posted. Okay, so those remember VJ who was there. So now we're going for scientist one positions. If you have students who are completing their PhD really soon or recently completed it, please apply for the position. If you have any questions, come and ask me. Um, the idea of these positions is they're going to be postdoc-ish, if you will. I can't call them a postdoc. They don't let me do that. But they will be involved in a lot of research projects. They will be involved if they want to teach. We can, you know, people can do that. Um, a little bit of outreach, supporting the HCI programs are going to be a nice little smattering of things. It can be used as a launching off point for maybe going for a faculty position later on, industry position, things like that. We want you to gain a lot of skills, whoever gets the job, and also helping us in our research projects and other endeavors uh, as we have. Um, our new staff, I know Stephen introduced them, but, but another round of applause, please, because they just do so much every single day. And you met Steve. Steve, wave again. That's our newest Steve, yes. So say hi to him. Um, and a couple little things I just want to highlight. So things are going really well, um, really, really well. We moved under engineering, and I was able to negotiate a nice little budget model, things like that. We really were restrictive when we were in the VPR's office. And they said to me, go grow. You know, they said, if you grow, you've got a nice big stick to go hit us with. So I've been hitting the dean and the associate deans with a big stick because our research expenditures are up 25%, so that is huge. Um, we have eclipsed $3 million. We're $3.1 million. We'll see where we are this year. Um, our HCI enrollment is significantly up. We grew during the pandemic, which no other program on campus did. Um, and we are continuing to grow, and our goal is to be over 200 in the fall. And we had a very successful recruiting event that we just did a couple weeks ago. Thank you to everybody who helped with that. We're making additional offers. We've been sort of beating the grad school over the head for additional fellowship money to make those offers. Um, so we're working really hard to, to increase that too. And all this growth just continues to then give me a bigger stick to go with the administration and say, hey, I want more stuff. Now, we did lose a lot of a big chunk of space. People know that. 
Um, the second floor space, I, I had no power to fight that. Those that know me know I have no problem going head to head with people. But that was ISU Online came together. You might know that the most efficient online program across the university was engineering. It was in Howell Hall, so they wanted to keep it in Howell Hall. They needed a big, giant room where they could put a lot of cubicles. There's only two spaces in Howell that have that. That's our first floor space and our second floor space. We pretty much made it for them. Um, so there was really nothing I could do. I got into a call no meeting with the dean of engineering. So the dean, he said, look, this is happening. Provost said we're taking that space, period. So there was like no negotiation. It was just done. We're getting some additional space underneath on the, on the, in the atrium. Underneath would be auditorium. Um, Glenn's been working really hard. He just had to leave. So there's going to be some additional space. It's not going to make up for all the space. But I've also been told that as new spaces open up and how, we are first in line to get that. And so when the new IMSE building is done, hopefully that might free up some additional space. So we're still working on, on getting back what we can. Um, but, you know, we're nice and cohesive. We got a lot of people. Things are going great. Keep it up. Anything I can do, the staff can do, Stephen can do, please come and talk to us. We really want to help. All right? I know sometimes I'm the big scary guy and you might come to my office and it's like going to the principal's office. I'm really not that mean, I promise. Shut up, Jack. Um, but, no, we want, we want to help you. We, we, want, we want you to, you know, we have criteria to be an HCI faculty now that we put in place. We have criteria to be a VRAC research faculty. They're pretty low bars, right, to, to cross. You know, VRAC, if you put a research proposal in over a three-year period, you are VRAC research faculty. You don't have to get it funded, but you got to put one through us. Hopefully we get funding, we keep working at that. But if, if we all keep working together, and the center can keep pushing up in all the different metrics that, that we need, but the more important to me is the community that we have. I mean, that's so important. I hope that that really is reflected. Um, we've had numerous visitors lately just say it feels like a family. And that I love that because that's what I try and push down. The staff does an amazing job of propagating that down. So if you need help with anything, right? Ezekiel came to us, wanted to run that event with a whole bunch of middle school kids and said, I want to do this on a weekend. And we were like, a oh, weekend on a bunch of middle schoolers? Okay, we'll make it happen. And, and we're going to grow in a bit, but it was never a no. It's always how can we do it? And that's really the, the mentality that the staff and I and Stephen have. So I hope that that comes through to everybody. And if there's anything we can ever do, please come and talk to us. And, and I love all of you. I'm glad that we're here. And um, that's it. I'm done. Thank you. So I have some brief updates about the program and how we're doing. We've got the student group. You already saw these faces from Amanda. And we've got a supervisory committee of faculty from different disciplines who make decisions about things like, well, this student wants to do a substitution course for this requirement. Could this possibly qualify? Or where should we focus our next efforts on new courses, that sort of thing. And uh, this, for all the faculty that are here, by the way, if, you th if there are courses in your department that you know of that might be of interest to HCI students, we have this sort of fire hose of interested students who will enroll in things that we point them to. So we can always point the fire hose at your course, and all of a sudden your enrollment will go up. And it, you, know, you have to decide if you want that. But your, <laughs> your department chair may well like that. So we're always looking for new courses for our students. Uh, here's some of the stats that Elliot referred to. Um, here's our, on the, on the left with the colorful bar, we have proportions, so you see about half the students in the green and up, up are online. And then we have the master students in the red that are both on campus. I mean, all of the, almost all the master students, MS, are on campus. And the PhD students are on campus. And so then there's some nice stats, like 62% um, female. We have actually the largest underrepresented population of all the grad programs at Iowa State, and this is largely because of our online student population, which is all across the U.S. and some internationally. Um, you might be interested in the curve there. You're like, what happened to in 2015? Uh, there, <laughs> there was interesting budget things. In 2014 and 2015, we had a lot of power on how to spend our own money, and that was um, some interesting handshake deals that you know, couldn't really last forever. And so then that didn't last forever. And so now we're trying to build back up under some new rules, but I think we're gonna do it. Um, when you think about HCI, you know, it involves all these different disciplines. And I just put some of the top career 
names. You know, I'm look, I try to connect on LinkedIn with as many of our alums as we can. I was looking through our alums and some of their titles, and then I searched for jobs in those titles. Right? So these numbers are jobs, job listings on LinkedIn for people with this title. Right, so, and there are some enormous ones up in the data analyst and the software developer, and then, but there's a lot in UX, right? The user experience designer, user center design, user interface designer, UX researcher. Uh, so there are a lot of opportunities here, right? And even if we started small and said, oh, UX researcher, I want, you know, what would it be like for our program to produce 5,000 UX researchers? Like, what would that have to look like to have happen? Uh, so that's some of the things I'm hoping you'll dream about as we go later into the activities. Um, the small group activity that we have after our speaker is where at your table, you're going to pick as a consensus at your table, you're going to pick one of these topics to brainstorm on, like solutions for how could industry be involved? How could ISU reach more students? How could we do better networking or community building within the program. I love stories of our classes where there's an online student in a class and there's an on-campus student and then one hires the other one. Or I've had online students hire each other like, oh, we were on a project together in class. I think that's great. That's what we're really all about because I want to build this community and the good feeling that we have here. The fourth one is interesting. Even though we, I think we're doing really well at HCI education, we're not really known for HCI research. Right there are there's the Chi conference is sort of a lead conference. There's there are HCI journals. So what would it look like if we promoted more HCI research as well? Um, as Elliot mentioned, we had an open house. We had these six. We took uh, the top applicants that we had. We sorted them and we said, here are ten that are our top. We're going to invite them. We're going to invite them with money to come. Uh, not all of them could come, but six could come. They came over. They uh, thanks to you, many of you came and helped interview them. And every one of them talked to at least two faculty members, some three or four. They toured. They really loved it. They were all impressed, as Elliot said, about the collegiality, the friendliness, the welcomeness for interdisciplinary work. And we've got offers to at least four of them out there. Um, I'm also proud of our industry instructors that help ground our program, I think, in both. We have academic instructors and we have industry instructors. So all of these people are people who have full-time jobs in industry or have previously worked in industry or now teaching for us at night or on the weekends in between. Uh, Sandra Ashmore is coming up. You haven't heard of her yet, probably. She's an alum from our program, and she's probably going to do globalization in the fall. We're excited about that. Um, yeah. um, I wanted to let you know that ISU Online, that did take our second floor, but they're doing really good things for us. They've always been a really good partner for advertising. They're working with us on a, on a pilot marketing campaign where we're going to have a lot. We've done some Google ads before. They're going to try to pump it up, more UTAB ads, a little branding and messaging, develop, even develop some videos. So they might be coming to you and saying, hey, can you fe feature in my video? Uh, if you haven't seen their web page, they have a really nice video about Elizabeth Holloway, one of our online alums. And you get this video of Elizabeth's story, and it just sort of like makes you feel good. So that's about all in the HCI program. I'm enthusiastic to grow, and I hope you'll help think about how you want to help. And then we'll do that in the activity afters. And now we're going to have our speaker. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Eric Brunvand. I'm a professor in the CollArts School of Computing at the um, University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Um, a tiny bit about me. My, my own research is not in HCI. Uh, my research group is interested in domain-specific computing, uh, particularly for computer graphics. So I guess there's a, there's a little bit of, of HCI-ish, computer graphics-y kinds of things, but I'm really more of a computer architecture researcher. But I do have a very strong interest in how arts and technology can collaborate in both education and in research to the benefit of both arts and technology, which I think is an important way of thinking about it. And so my talk today is really to, to just bring up some ideas of how um, computational thinking and design thinking are natural partners, how you can think about connecting between technology and arts, um, and maybe just bring up some history that you, you may not be aware of. Now, you may all know this stuff, and that's great, um, but if you haven't heard of some of these things, hopefully it will be a little catalyst to go and look up some of these arts projects from the past. Um, so the, the question really is, technology and the arts, are they compatible at all? 
Um, I think they are. I think probably HCI researchers are more friendly to that idea than some audiences I, I talk to. Um, but that's really the crux of what we're talking about. So I, I refer back to a lecture from 1959 often. Um, this is C.P. Snow, who was a chemist at Cambridge in the UK. He gave what's called the Reed Lecture at Cambridge, which is a famous lecture because it's got a name, um, about arts and about basically about the two cultures of, in his case, humanities and science. But the, the, the things he was talking about in 1959 are really very, very relevant to technology and arts in the same sort of context. And he, in his lecture, the entire point of the two cultures lecture, which has been published in a book that you can, you can obviously go find now, um, is lamenting this separation in how these disciplines have diverged over time and how people in the humanities, people in the sciences, people in the arts, people in technology cannot really communicate the way that they used to. So at the risk of reading out loud a long quote, he, he says, I believe the intellectual life of the whole of Western society is increasingly being split into two polar groups. And this polarization is a sheer loss to us all as a people and as a society. It is at the same time practical and intellectual and creative loss. And I repeat that it is false to imagine that these three considerations are clearly separable. So it's a wonderful, well, actually, it's mostly a wonderful lecture to read. He goes off on some strange things. You know, it's 1959. Um, but, it's, but, I, but I do encourage you to check it out because there's some, there's some very relevant discussions about how people in these seemingly disparate fields can learn to communicate better to the benefit of us all. And so I take sort of inspiration from that to think about how to combine arts and technology to the benefit of both of these fields. And it's really important to say both ways because in, depending on who you're talking to, you can easily see perhaps how technology can enhance the arts. And it may be a little harder, at least in some circles, to see how arts can enhance technology. But I believe it really does benefit both camps, especially if you think about it in the right way. So I'm going to go through some very quick slides on ancient history, just thinking about how artists have embraced new technology. Artists are very good at finding new bits of technology and using it for their own purposes, whether or not that was intended for that technology in the first place. So uh, Naum Gabo in um, 1919 and 1920 this is a very simple sculpture. It's basically a metal rod with a motor in the base that spins the rod. And because there's a counterweight on the rod, when it spins, it, it expands into a, into a shape. The name of the piece was Kinetic Construction Standing Wave. And it's the first example of something that would be considered a sculpture by an artist that included a motor. It's also the first piece of work that used the title with the word kinetic in it. So this is, in some ways, the first kinetic sculpture. Uh, Marcel Duchamp, an artist you should be familiar with if you look at the history of art in any context, um, also in the 1920s built this rotary glass plate precision optics sculpture with the help of another avant-garde artist, Man Ray. It's a very simple sculpture when you really think about it. It's some glass plates on rods with a motor that spins. But put yourself in the context of 1920. This is a sculpture with a motor that needs to move in order to actually do its sculptural thing. So this is actually pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, whoops, this was supposed to play automatically. Um, Laszlo Maholi Naj is another artist, another avant-garde artist of the time. You can tell they're avant-garde because the movies they made of their work have really cool avant-garde titles. Um, we don't need to see all of the titles because it takes a while before you actually get to um, the piece that they're, they're talking about. These are the avant-garde titles from the 20s, um, spinning titles on spinning balloons. Um, but if we zoom ahead <laughs> to the actual sculpture, this is a collection of lucite, which was a brand new material, of course, in the 1920s, um, and kitchen items sort of assembled into a thing that moved around and sort of individual pieces moved together and the whole thing rotated. Um, one of the interesting things about the light space modulator, what a great name, by the way, the light space modulator, um, is that when Maholi Naj talked about this, he didn't really think of this 
thing as the sculpture. He thought about the shadows and the shapes on the wall that were interacting with the light as really part of the sculpture, which I think is sort of a, a lovely way of sort of looking forward to the kinds of projection and, and other kinds of art that we would be more familiar with today. Uh, Jean Tangli was an artist, a Swiss artist, who built a series of what he called metamatics in the 1950s. Um, these were sculptures that made drawings. So they're mechanical sculptures that, through their sculptural artistic performance, made drawings. And when you read some of the things that Tongli would say about these metamatics, he would be very clear that, he, that the, the, item, the thing itself was a sculpture. That's part of the art. But it makes a drawing, which is part of the art. But it's also a performance, because you see the drawing being made in the process of the thing moving. And so the performance was part of the artwork as well. So he was really exploring all these different aspects of where the art is when you have one of these pieces that moves and also makes marks. I'm, I'm told that at this kind of opening, he would sort of rip off a piece of this and say, here, you have some art. <laughs> I wish I had one. I would put it on the wall. <laughs> Uh, Desmond Paul Henry was a, a philosophy professor at Manchester University who had a fondness for mechanical devices. And what he discovered was that there were these really complicated analog computers in World War II bombers. These were bomb site calculating computers. They're analog, but they had very complicated series of gyros and gears and components and the, the, the bomb engineer would put in all the airspeed and the weight of the bomb and the, the temperature and it would tell it when to open the door and, and drop the bomb. Well, he repurposed that into a, a, a delightfully complex drawing maker. So he made these drawings using this repurposed analog computer. Um, and then we get to slightly more modern, it's 1960s at Bell Labs, and this gigantic room-sized thing was the first microfilm printer that they installed at Bell Labs. So this was the printer. <laughs> this tape drive was the input for the printer. Turns out the reason this printer was so huge is it was actually projecting onto a cassette of microwave, or um, not microwave, um, microfilm. And so it was drawing directly by exposing lines on the microfilm. And then half of this printer was a wet lab developer for the microfilm. <laughs> so it was like those, those drive-in labs, if you're old enough to remember, sort of going and dropping your film off at the, at the, the, the photo booth. Um, but he, as a researcher at Bell Labs, with this brand new printing equipment said, you know what, I bet I could write Fortran code to make images. And so he started writing code to generate images directly on the microfilm. Ivan Sutherland should be a name that if you're not familiar with, I encourage you to become familiar with because he's really, 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 really smart. Um, in 1963, for his PhD dissertation at MIT, he, and I'm not exaggerating, invented interactive computer graphics. Pretty much everything that you think of that is involved in interactive computer graphics on a screen, he invented. It's crazy. Um, and the way he did it is that as a graduate student, he said to his advisor, Claude Shannon, another name that is kind of up there in the pantheon of computer science, he said, Claude, there's this computer in the basement, the TX2. It takes up the whole basement, but it's got a screen and it's got a light pen. I would like to make a package that I can sit and draw on that screen. And his advisor said, Ivan, you're a smart guy. I have no idea what you're talking about. Why would anyone want to sit at a screen and draw on the, OK, fine, go do it. But you can only do it between 3 in the morning and 5 in the morning, because that's when the computer is not being used. And so he had his own personal computer the size of this room from 3 to 5 in the morning, and he invented interactive computer graphics. He also invented VR, by the way. <laughs> Not really invented, but he, he and his team at Harvard built the world's first VR headset um, called the Sword of Damocles um, because the headset involved strapping CRTs to the side of your head so you think about maybe you know, 10,000 volts right at your temples, which was kind of an interesting 
way of putting things on, on the screen, and then mirrors that would project those, those images into your eyes. And it was so heavy that there was a support system that went up to the ceiling that looked like a sword over your head. So, um, but the, the original VR headset was also um, something that, that Sutherland and his group did. Um, I've got, I, I actually took a lot of slides out of this presentation, but I think I left too many in. So I'm going to move fairly quickly, and I hate it when speakers say that. But at least <laughs> you'll see little snippets of some of these things. Um, 1966 in, had a, a seminal event in technology and arts collaborations, which was the nine evenings of uh, performance art through the EAT program, which was Experiments in Art and Technology, a group of um, progressive artists in New York, including John Cage, including Merce Cunningham, including uh, Rauschenberg, and a bunch of researchers from Bell Labs who were paired up with these artists to do performance technology arts performances. Um, it was a bit of a failure in the art sense. <laughs> it, was, it was a grand goal to get these artists connected with these Bell Labs researchers to do amazing things. Many of them did not work quite as well as they hoped, but historically speaking, it was huge. And people who look back on this sort of see this as one of the, one of the seminal events, one of the, the first kinds of really tight arts and communications, arts and technology communications. Uh, Billy Kluver was one of the co-organizers. He was a Bell Labs researcher. And he talks about Rauschenberg's strong commitment to collaboration. And this was not something that artists would talk about with their technical partners at the time. The idea that you would consider your technical partner a collaborator and not just a technician who was helping you do the art was radical. But this was fundamental to the way that Kluver and Rauschenberg wanted to set up the nine evenings. Um, another seminal event was an, a show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, The Machine as Seen at the End of the Mechanical Age. Um, it was works including Leonardo drawings all the way up to arts and technology collaborations from EAT. Another great historical event in the world of arts and technology was the cybernetic serendipity show in London in 1968, which um, was thematically centered on this relation of computers and creativity. These are some pictures from the cybernetic serendipity show in 1968. Um, I think it's fascinating how much this looks like something we could imagine seeing in a gallery today. Sure, the computers are a little different, there might be more wires, but it kind of looks very familiar if you're thinking about how you could, you could launch a show of computer and arts technology. And then a little bit of sort of art historical reading for the very curious, because some of this art historical stuff is hard to read, um, but Jack Burnham was an art critic who wrote a lot about the emergence of technology-mediated artworks. And so he particularly was known for what he called the systems approach to sculpture, where it was not the physical object that was the sculpture, it was the system that was implied by the work that you're doing that was really where the art was, was embodied. And so, um, like I say, some of these are a little hard to get through if you're not already familiar with how to read art historical criticism, but um, systems aesthetics from Art Forum in 1968, real-time systems from 1969, wonderful stuff, one foundational stuff in how to think about the system as the art as opposed, as opposed to the artifact as the art. And um, one of the things Burnham did is he organized a show in 1970 called Software that was very specifically and very intentionally all about how you could use software to, as a medium for making art. And it was 1970, very early attempt at sort of showing this kind of thing. Again, not everything worked perfectly. This one had a little bit better sort of critical review at the time because I think the critics were sort of coming around to this idea that maybe there was something to this technological um, collaboration. Don't want to read all of this, but basically he's saying that he doesn't, he doesn't think computers are going to create art. I'm not sure whether we all agree with that now with Dolly and 
diffusion and all these other sort of AI art generators. But, but his point was that the, the, the computing was going to be a very helpful tool in the creation of these kinds of creative works. Um, Ed Catmull and Fred Park were early researchers. You may know Ed Catmull's name. He was the uh, founder of Pixar and ended up being the president of both Pixar and Disney. Um, this is one of the first animations that he made with another grad student at the University of Utah in 1972. Again, with the titles. Um, people love making titles. Um, but basically, this was... Ed Catmull's a fascinating guy because from, the, from when he was a grad student until he retired, his entire life goal was to make computer animations. So when he got to the University of Utah in 1970, he said, I want to make computer animations. And the faculty at the time said, uh, that sounds hard. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but uh, you know, I'm going to do some back of the envelope calculations. And I think we could, given what I, what I think I know about Moore's law and about how computing is accelerating, I figure in 20 years we'll be able to make a feature film. Turns out Toy Story came out about 20 years after he said that, so he did a really good back of the envelope calculation, but it required that you, you believe in exponential growth, because that's a very hard curve to sort of understand if you don't do the math and believe it. In the 1970s, people were making more of these computer-assisted drawings, sort of in the mode of um, A. Michael Knoll. Of course, Namjoon Pike was building lots of sculptures that involved then high-tech CRTs, now we think of them as retro, um, but at the time he was one of the few really mainstream artists who was doing work with CRT displays. Turns out Andy Warhol was a computer artist. This was only discovered after he passed away. Someone said, what's that big box of computer disks in his effects? And somebody said, I don't know, they kind of look like Amiga disks? You all rem who, who remembers the, the Amiga PC? The three old guys in the room. <laughs> the Amiga was a PC in the 1980s that was notable for its graphics. It had better graphics than any other PC you could buy, um, which doesn't mean they were great by today's standards. It just means they were better than, than some of the others you could buy. And it turns out Andy Warhol, he's making a drawing of Debbie Harry there um, uh, from Blondie. Um, so he made a whole bunch of these drawings, and they were just sort of tucked away on computer disks, and they had to sort of reconstruct how to read Amiga data files <laughs> to see what was on them. But it turns out he did a whole bunch of these drawings just for himself that were never published in his lifetime. Um, of course, you know, 1980s brought CGI to the table um, with Tron in 1980, was it 84, was it 82? I don't remember now off the top of my head. So, now I want to just show you some snippets from some more um, contemporary arts and tech um, kinds of sculptors. Jim Campbell is a San Francisco-based artist who's very interested in low-resolution graphics, not high-resolution graphics. So this um, video that you're seeing is basically a string of LEDs that are placed about three inches away from the wall, so they're projecting backwards onto the wall, making big, fuzzy, indistinct pixels and then he's projecting home movies on this very low-res screen as an intentional way of sort of getting it to be impressionistic and blurry. Um, this piece is a, a piece with, with um, liquid crystal display where the closer you get, the more opaque it gets. So when you try and examine it closely, you can't see it anymore, and you can only really see it when you get back further away and can't see it very well. Um, this is a piece that he had installed in the San Jose airport. I'm just saddened that it's not there anymore. The last time I flew through San Jose, I went looking for it, and something else is there now, so they took it down. But again, uh, uh, this was a, a low-res display made of tens of thousands of LEDs in little ping pong ball diffusers hanging from the ceiling of the San Jose airport. And so as you're waiting for your plane to depart, a swimmer would swim by on the ceiling every once in a while. It was just, it was mesmerizing. I'm not sure he's completely serious. But this is really a nice distillation of how to make computer art. This is Jim Campbell. It's on his website. It says, this is how you make computer art. You take some input, some position, some color, some movement. You have an invisible computer that interprets that input, and it causes something to happen. The robot moves. Something lights up. This is it. I mean, yeah, he's not completely serious, but it's kind of it. 
<laughs> you know, you take, you take some environmental input, you do something to it with invisible computing, and you cause something to happen. Shazam! Got computer art. Maybe. <laughs> uh, oh, this is me. I, I just want to show, in a, I, I, I don't want to talk too much about my work, but I do dabble in this stuff. Um, this is a piece that I built um, a number of years ago to, to address some issues of security. I built this whole little city, and I had these cameras zooming in on little people, and I had lots of CRT surveillance monitors. Um, this is a piece I did with a um, sculpture professor at the University of Utah. Um, it is a piece where you're invited to touch these brass hands, but you can't actually reach that far, so you have to make a connected chain with other people. And it turns out that the more people you have in the chain, the more this fractured image coalesces on the screen and becomes a full image. Um, it, and, and the distorted audio goes away. So, so the more people you have in the chain, the more, the more complete the image becomes. And because I'm a computer architect and build integrated circuits as part of my research, I've also put little designs on these integrated circuits. Uh, this little bird here is about 300 microns by 300 microns. So you have, if I pass the chip around, which I should have brought, I didn't bring a chip, I should have thought to bring a chip, um, you'd have to sort of trust me that it's there because you can't really see it without, <laughs> without some magnification. Um, but it occurred to me that, that these layers of materials that we're putting down on integrated circuits look different under a microscope. So the natural question is, can you use those layers sort of like screen print paint layers to make an image? And it turns out you can. It also turns out that if you collaborate with another artist at the University of Utah and you put these very sort of fractured images on the chip, you get in trouble because the people who are doing quality control looked at that chip and they said, oh man, the metal is cracking. Shut down the, the, the fab line. And they got really mad at me because I said, no, no, it's supposed to look like that. They said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> Uh, Daniel Rosen is a professor at um, NYU in their um, strangely named, um, oh, now I've got, I forgot the name, um, Interactive Telecommunications Program, ITP. He's been there for many years, and he builds what he calls mechanical mirrors. So the idea that he had was if you take some piece of mechanics and you can make it either bright or dark, then you can use that as a pixel. So this wooden screen up here, the wooden mirror, has thousands of, actually hundreds, I guess, maybe not quite a thousand, um, little polished pieces of wood with servos behind each one so you can tilt it backwards or forwards. And if you tilt it backwards, it looks bright. And if you tilt it forwards, it looks dark. And so there's a little camera in the middle doing some image processing and just adjusting each one of those pixels to make a low-res physical mirror out of wood instead of out of mirror materials. Now, he's built a lot of these different mechanical mirrors this one has chrome balls that either go in or out to make light or dark. So now the question is, if all you need is something that can be either light or dark, you've got an incredible palette of things you can use to make mechanical mirrors, including toy penguins, <laughs> which is one of my favorite mechanical mirrors. So if you have toy penguins and you rotate them to either show their bellies or show their back, you have black and white pixels. So now you can make a mechanical mirror out of a thousand penguins. We'll get to the actual mirror part in a second. There it is. I mean, who wouldn't love this piece of art, right? <laughs> um, Alan Rath is another San Francisco based sculpture sculptor who uses robotics in his sculpture. Um, one of the things that he leverages is our built-in lizard brain connection with eyeballs. You know, it turns out that the, you know, when you look at somebody, it's, even if you're just a tiny child, you look straight into their eyeballs because that's sort of how we're wired. So anything that has eyeballs on it automatically looks either human or creepy, depending on, on how you put it together. So he's got a number of these works that have these tiny little CRTs. Those itsy bitsy little CRTs were actually the, the CRTs that were in, the, in the, the, the monitor for television cameras back in the 50s and 60s. So when you looked in, you were looking at one of those little teeny screens, and now he's leveraging those um, in his work. 
but he also does a number of other sort of non-creepy, well, depends on how you define creepy, I guess, um, other works that sort of combine robotics and organic materials. Um, very simple idea here. The idea is that if you have a lot of these little motors that can move in synchrony and you put long pheasant tail feathers on them, that the organic movement of the feather combined with the mechanical movement of the quick twisting makes a very compelling combination. Um, this particular piece was not interactive. <laughs> it just did its own thing, but people thought it was, and so people would come up. I saw this piece in the um, San Jose Museum of Art, and people would try and interact with it because they figured it must be interactive, and so people would sort of, and they'd do something and something would happen, and they'd think, oh yeah, I'll try that again, and then it didn't happen. So um, I don't know whether he was playing with the audience or not, but, um, but he builds a, a number of these sort of robot-based things. Now, interestingly, Alan Rath and, um, I just lost his name, the, Jim Campbell, uh, <laughs> were both electrical engineering undergraduates at MIT before they decided to become artists. So they are from the transition generation where if you want to do technology-mediated, robotic, kinetic, computer-controlled artwork, you have to have an electrical engineering or computer science background because the tools were such that you had to build a lot of your own stuff. And I think that one of the wonderful things we have nowadays is that the state of the art in embedded controllers, in, in motor controllers, in just the support you need to get something like that built has has accelerated to the point that it's available to almost anyone now. So they were a wonderful sort of transition between when you needed Bell Labs, <laughs> when you could do it yourself, but you needed a technical background, and now the tools are there for almost anyone. Um, Peter Vogel is a Swiss artist who builds electronic sculptures that make sound. And the interesting thing about these sculptures, at least to me, is that these are electrical components that make up the sculpture, but they are not just decorative. The circuit that is being built is actually built out of those electrical components. So this is actually a circuit that makes sound as part of the sculpture, and he's just very good at making it look cool while he's building it, so not on a printed circuit board. Um, this is the one piece that does have some sound on it, so I'll turn my sound up a little bit. This one is interactive, so this is the artist interacting with one of his sculptures on the wall, and those little black dots are light sensors. I don't know if we're getting sound through the main feed or not, but um, by, by moving his hand over the different parts of that sculpture, he's causing di triggering different sound actions that are all generated from the circuits that are on the wall. But again, I don't want to play too much of it because I want to get through the slides and have time for questions. Um, <laughs> Jack Dahlhausen also builds sort of exposed circuits, but in a, in a much messier style. Uh, Peter Vogel's Swiss. I don't know if that implies anything about his preference for very highly designed tight things. Um, Jack Dahlhausen is a professor of art at um, Washington State University in Pullman. Uh, Leo Villarreal, I think this sound is not important for that, is another um, artist who uses large arrays of LEDs. This is in the tunnel between the east and west buildings of the National Gallery of Art in DC. If you look at the um, label for this artwork, it will say that it's 40,000 LEDs and Mac Mini is the medium. His work is very generative so and can scale. It turns out that his, one of his palettes is the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, where they've installed LEDs on the support columns for the Bay Bridge, not the Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge over to, to um, Oakland. Um, and every night, different generative shapes appear on the Bay Bridge. Um, I, it was supposed to be temporary when they put it up. People liked it so much, they found the funds to make it permanent. Um, so the next time you're in San Francisco down by the, down by the water, um, check this out. If I zoom forward, you can see a, a sort of more interesting patterns here. But think big. <laughs> why, why, why stop at a wall? Why not go all the way to a bridge? So 
that's, wow, I really am staying on time. Maybe I should slow down. Um, <laughs> so that's really part of what I, what I really wanted to, to, to get you all thinking about is how engineering problem solving and creative design thinking are really two halves of sort of the same problem, but we think about them very differently. You know, I was talking to Stephen earlier and we were talking about how in studio arts you have critiques and in engineering school you have design reviews and they're really very similar. They're trying to sort of accomplish the same thing, but it also at some level they're very different. And so I think it would be interesting for HCI students to experience both the studio art critique mode and also the engineering design review mode and think about how those things are both trying to help move towards a final completed work but also sort of very different in spirit in terms of how how people approach those things. Um, this has not escaped other researchers and other writers. Um, there were two reports that came out from the National um, National Academy of Engineering, trying to, and one of these reports I think made a very interesting point that there is a, again, subtle difference between technological literacy and technological fluency. And so this being fluent report, which came out in the early 2000s, really tried to make this point that across all education levels in the United States from K-12 up through undergrad up through graduate school that it might be interesting to think about how to educate students to be fluent in the technology rather than just literate with the technology where in this sense literate means I've seen it, I know it exists, but fluency implies that you can use it in a new situation that maybe you hadn't encountered before and so one of the things that I've done at the University of Utah is to try and think about how I might use that idea of technological fluency in new courses that could be directed at all of campus, not just computer science or computer engineering majors. Um, so I do have two courses that I could talk about if we don't have any questions that will take up the rest of the time. Um, one that I teach with my collaborators in the sculpture area in the Department of Art and Art History at Utah, Kinetic Art and Embedded Systems. This is a course where we get students from both the computer science and computer engineering programs and also the sculpture program in the art department. We get them working together to build, design, and display kinetic embedded controlled sculptures. Um, we very intentionally require them to work in groups that have both computer science, computer engineering, and artists because even though the end result is a, is a gallery show of the works that they've created, the educational result is that the students have learned a little bit about how to talk to them, talk to the other students. And one of the things that C.P. Snow was talking about in the two cultures and the National Academy of Engineering report was talking about with technological fluency is if we can't even communicate, if we don't know the language of the other field that we're collaborating with, it's very hard to make progress. And it's not hard to learn to communicate with the two cultures. We just have to put ourselves in a situation where we learn and understand the two different cultures or the two different languages. So learning, having my engineering students learn to speak art and having my art students learn to speak tech um, is, is really the educational the actual outcomes that I'm looking for, even though the gallery show is sort of the, 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 the showy um, result at the end of the semester. And then I also have an interest in sound art, using sound as a medium instead of physical objects as a medium. And so I have a, a 2000 level course, which is freshman and sophomore level course for non-majors um, in using sound art to, to make noise. And the idea there is a, is a very sneaky, I don't know if it's very sneaky, I intend it to be a little sneaky, um, intro to technology, but in the guise of making noise and making sound art. And so for that class, um, I'm sure you do the same at Iowa State, uh, we have student evaluations at the end of the semester where they can make comments about what they've learned or what they didn't like. And uh, my favorite comment from the making noise, sound art, and digital media class was a student who said, 
Even though this wasn't the point of the class, I learned a lot about technology and programming, which is great. And I said to myself, but that was the point, and you didn't know it. It was great. It was perfect. So it was like if I had written the comment myself, it couldn't have been better than that one. So um, I do have some slides on those courses if you're curious, but um, come talk to me afterwards also if you, you want to hear about those. I don't want to take too much public time talking about these courses. But I'll just conclude and say that my thesis that I hope you also find interesting, at least at some level, is that artists benefit from knowing something about technology. Technologists benefit from knowing something about art. There's this wonderful, if I use the Oreo technology um, terminology, we have a really nice arts chocolate cookie and we have a really nice technology chocolate cookie, but the magic is really in the filling in between that holds them together. Um, so we all benefit from knowing a little about both. So with that, I'll be happy to take questions and talk at length about any of these topics that you found interesting. So thank you very much. <laughs> questions? What do you think are some of the biggest barriers at the moment to, to this happening? And, <sighs> and is it changing? There are so many sort of potential barriers, especially when you, when you think about what you mean by this happening. Um, if by this happening you mean having these cross-college courses that introduce students from different sides of campus and get them working together, um, one of the biggest obstacles is just administration who don't understand. And I, you know, this, this is a crowd who can understand this, right, who don't understand why you would want to teach a course with somebody in a different college, right? Why, why should part of my computer science teaching load be this course that I teach with the art department. Um, who gets the credit? I don't care, but some administrator somewhere cares who gets the student credit hour credit for that course, and I'm happy to give it to whoever's the loudest. <laughs> um, so there is some sort, of, some sort of intellectual inertia on parts of at least some administrators. Some get it. Um, there's also a little intellectual inertia in the two fields. I would say that I may be the only computer science faculty who would consider teaching this course. My collaborators in the sculpture area in the art department may be the only ones in the College of Fine Arts. I don't think they are, actually. I think College of Fine Arts is more open to this. Um, but in the engineering school, I would say that it's not automatically something that the faculty would consider an interesting direction to go, unless perhaps they're in an HCI program. Um, how much cross-pollination do you see between the merging of art and technology and music and technology? Ah, great question. I focused really on visual arts because that's the courses that I've been teaching, but there's a very rich collaboration, at least possibly, between music and technology as well. Um, you know, I think we could probably talk about that as well, um, but um, in terms of there are lots of ways to look at this. The easy way to look at this is sort of the technology of synthesizers and, and synthesized sound and music is clearly some place where technologists were very important in the early days of sort of understanding how to do um, sound synthesis. Um, nowadays, how do you, suppose you have a video game that has, um, that will take the player 50 hours to complete. Do you compose 50 hours of music for that video game? Probably not. Do you figure out how to generate interesting, um, contextually appropriate music for what's going on in the game, but automatically generate it as the gameplay is happening because you don't know how they're going to react next? Yes. So now there's a really interesting question of how to do that so it sounds good and appropriate, but also gets generated algorithmically. If I, if I delve into the sound art slides, you know, I'll talk about people like Brian Eno, who's a pioneer in generative and ambient music, who um, has done music-based art installations with generative music techniques for many years. Um, could you walk us through the thought pr your thought process behind one of your artworks, one of your pieces? One of my pieces? Yes. <laughs> um, sure. Um, oops, I'm going the wrong way. So this 
this piece is a collaborative piece I did with, with sculptor Wendy Wisher. Um, what had happened in around Salt Lake City just before we decided to make this piece was that there was an oil spill in a stream that was coming down into the Salt Lake Valley. And this was a stream that was very pristine. It was actually in a, in a protected part of a canyon, so it was very, very clean water. But it turns out, we didn't know this, but there was a Chevron oil pipeline that came through, and it polluted the stream, and it came down into the Salt Lake Valley, and it was really kind of a terrible mess. And so we thought, how can we address that issue and also address the idea of collaboration as a way of addressing environmental impact so that you could encourage people to think about how can I work with people to solve things and not, it's not just me, it has to be a collaborative effort across different people. So we came up with this idea of filming the creek with recordings of the little babbling brook and then distorting it and using these physical mirrors to sort of distort that image and distort the sound, but then as people would collaborate and form a human chain between those hands, it would become more and more cohesive and resolve into a clean creek image and a clean babbling brook sound, whereas it was distorted and ugly before. I, that, that's a hard, that, that's a lot of conceptual baggage to put on a piece of sculpture. So we did have some little notes about, <laughs> about what was going on, but that was the thought process behind this one. Um, I won't go into quite as much detail, but the, the, um, the, the surveillance piece was really thinking about the surveillance state and how um, closed circuit cameras are everywhere watching all of us all the time. And we don't know it, we don't pay attention to it, we don't see it, but these cameras are everywhere. And if, if somebody really did have access to all these cameras, they could track you wherever you were going within Ames because all these cameras are here and you don't even know where they are. Um, and so I, I frankly had discovered these kind of looming cameras in the university surplus with these little armed, articulated arms. And I thought, oh boy, I gotta use those. And so I bought all these little cameras and then I built this city and I built, you know, put these little teen people in it and I had these cameras looming over them to imply that surveillance state. Um, and then, just because I like retro CRTs, I made sort of a uh, uh, guard station that was watching over everything. And then I put other cameras in the gallery. So in addition to watching the static scene that's in the little city, there were also cameras watching the viewers in different places in the, in the building. Um, yeah, my wife says I gotta get rid of it because there are you know, 20 different CRTs in our basement clogging up a lot of space. And she says, are you ever gonna do anything with that? No, I don't know, it's just, it's great. I love black and white CRTs. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I had a question. Uh, how do you think your artistic endeavors have enhanced or furthered your research? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, at some level, it is just a intellectual exercise in thinking differently about different things. And, you know, one of the things that I, I, I especially say to undergraduates who, I don't know if it happens in HCI or in other departments that, that people are associated with, but in, in computer science and computer engineering, undergraduates hate general education requirements. Why do I have to take that humanities class? Why do I have to take that arts class? Why do I have to do this? I just want to take programming. And I tell them, well, I try not to sound luxury when I tell them, but you know, I try and point out that as an undergraduate, this is your opportunity to study and learn about things that are not even in your area. You should embrace this opportunity, not dread it. You should, you should look for a class in the fine arts, in humanities, in social science, in you know, music, and embrace the opportunity to become a more well-rounded, um, intellectually interested person, which can inform anything you want to do later. You don't know how it's going to inform that later, but it will. And I don't know if anyone believes me, but I do try and preach that. So, so I think the answer is I don't see a direct connection between what I'm doing and my artistic side, but I'm sure it's there because it makes me more aware of connections between things that are not directly related to domain-specific computing. Now, the domain-specific computing that my students and I have been working on is involved in highly realistic 
computer graphics ray traced image generation, so maybe there's a connection there, but really it's a little tenuous. <laughs> just, just to build on that, since you've been a rotator at National Science Foundation for several years, how does your life of art and appreciation and thinking overlap <laughs> with that? Yeah, as Stephen implies, I'm, I'm professor at the University of Utah, but for the last three years I've been a program officer at the National Science Foundation, so I'm just coming back from that gig. Um, one of the reasons, there are a number of reasons why one would do this silly thing, which is to, to give up your academic career for three years and go become a government bureaucrat at the National Science Foundation um, reading proposals all day. Um, one reason is to sort of give back to the community. I've been funded by NSF and I really feel like I need to help out the younger researchers and give back by helping with the decisions that, that are made on research dollars. But when I went to the NSF, one of my interview slides was specifically about arts and technology and encouraging within the computer and information science and engineering, it's a mouthful, directorate at the National Science Foundation, which is where the computer science funding comes from, to encourage more opportunity for researchers who want to, not to force it on people who don't want to, but to encourage those to have an avenue for those researchers who would like to involve artists in their research project to be able to get some funding to do that. And so one of the things, now I came at a very awkward time to do that because I got there in September 2019 and then in March 2020 everyone went home and we were virtual for two years so I didn't really get to walk around the halls and talk to people as much as I wanted. Um, but even though we're recording this I think I can say that that is still something which we're working on. <laughs> I can't promise any new program that's happening because we can't say anything about programs until they're released publicly, but I am still continuing to work at the NSF to help find a path for researchers who are already funded by the NSF in other ways to get supplemental funding to include artists and um, artists full stop whether that's humanities, whether it's music, whether it's dance, whether it's visual arts, but to get artistic people involved in their research groups and to provide some supplemental funding to do that. So that's one of the reasons I went to NSF. I don't know how it will play out, but it's not dead yet. <laughs> Hi. Um, there's a current trend of AI that everybody can Pretty much press a button to create a so-called artwork. Yeah. Do you think that this trend will be the threat to the art industry, or you think that the art industry will embrace this AI technology? <sighs> that is, we we need to go out and have a drink and talk about that for hours because that is that's a long conversation. Um, I think the short answer is that history has shown that every time there have been dire predictions about the death of art because some new technology that artists have adapted and found new ways to, to either incorporate that or to find other modes. So, you know, this very same question was asked um, earlier in the 20th century about photography. Now that we have photography, is painting dead? Because at the time, at least some people were thinking painting is about making realistic images of life, and now we have this new technology that's better at doing that. So, oh, painting's done. Well, it turns out painting wasn't done. Um, and, you know, you can also, you can look at other inflection points in the art world where people have had the same conversation, you know, is, will this be the death of fine art? This one admittedly seems like a pretty interesting inflection point, but I think that in my optimistic moments, I'm, I'm convinced that artists will adapt and that art will, will um, move in new directions to find new, new ways of expressing itself. Um, it certainly will democratize basic artworks. I think, you know, the fact that pretty much anyone can make kind of a weird, interesting image using an image generator now is kind of interesting. But I think the same way that desktop publishing didn't make everybody a Pulitzer Prize winning author, AI generated artworks won't make everybody a well respected artist. So I think, I hope it doesn't cause too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, we'll do one more after Kimberly. Hi. So um, I have lots that I want to <laughs> chat with you about, but in this kind of public forum, I guess. 
I'm curious if you could think about an asymmetry here between the art and the technology, mm -hmm. where in this mode, you are an artist. Mm -hmm. you, your medium are objects and um, instruments and visions that are created technologically, but in fact, it's it's an art production. Okay. So, and it's also social commentary. Yes. Right. Yeah. And um, at the beginning of the talk, when you were showing us the avant-garde artists, a piece that's often lost is that that's all social commentary, as well. Right. I yep. mean, th there's so much to say about those artists yep. and where they were and why. Yep. So I wonder if, on the technology side, if you could say a little bit about how the same thing could happen, where it's not an engineer making art, but it's actually a technologist who's using technology the way that art has functioned, which is <laughs> as social commentary, as um, a way to have experiences and thoughts that are outside of functionality, that are, that are the beyond the, the, the things that we absolutely need to do, art is a kind of you know, gives us a consciousness beyond the absolute need. So, can you think about the the, the mirrored, the, the mirrored situation where technology doesn't just become art, but it actually tries to do something that's more functions the way that art operates in our society? I don't know if that question is too much to ask. Wow. <laughs> Are you sure we can't go get a drink and <laughs> <laughs> talk about this? <laughs> Um, wow, so many different directions I could go with that. I think, you know, in some sense, what differentiates somebody who uses stable diffusion to make a picture of a cat and an artist who's making a social comment that involves an image that looks like a cat? And fundamentally, what, what, what is different about those two things is the content is the the intellectual content. It's the message. It's the it's the underlying um, intent of making some sort of comment on on the world through that image, and perhaps maybe that's as good a definition of art as any. That you know, Marcel Duchamp said, I can't unfortunately say it in French, but he said, "What can I make that is not art?" And so for him, everything that he did, his life, his games of chess, his everything that he does, how can you say that what I'm doing is not art? How can I do something that is not? Um, and, you know, of course, we could take that to extremes, but, um, but I think, you know, perhaps one of the things you're getting at is that this social commentary, this idea of having a conceptual basis for why you are doing this is in some ways what makes it art as opposed to a pretty image. And so the person who engages in that contextualizing, in that conceptual basis for what you are doing is an artist regardless of what direction they've come from. And so, you know, I don't want to sound too grandiose, but, you know, this is me as an artist because I had, do have a conceptual basis. You can agree with my conceptual basis. You can, you can, we can argue over whether it's relevant and whether I've done a good job of, of sort of expressing that conceptual basis. But I did have a conceptual basis for this piece. And so in that context, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm an artist. Um, on the other hand, um, if I made a pretty image of my dog, which I have also done, um, that might have just been a technological trick to make an image that I found enjoyable. So, but yeah, wow, what a, what a, what a, what a thesis statement for improved or expanded discussion. <laughs> All right, well, let's thank our speaker, Dr. Aaron Brunvon. And again, thank you for inviting me. I've had a, a wonderful day. Thank you for making the weather so nice while I'm here. Um, <laughs> I can't imagine a better talk for getting us thinking creatively and thinking differently than when we walked in tonight. So what I'm hoping you'll do is resource some of that creativity. I encourage you to stand up for about five minutes, get more food. There's desserts. And we're going to put some stuff out on the tables. And if you are sitting, maybe Ritwick, you can move to join a group. Elliot could join a group, something like that. And we'll try some group brainstorming and problem solving here for just a little bit of time. This will be structured brainstorming to enable uh, introverts to excel. So see if your table can decide which of these five problems to work on. And be sure to mark that on your sheet on the top somewhere. What are your names? Write your names on your sheet. 
and write your topic. Like we're doing topic three or we're doing topic five, which is about too many bananas in programming. I don't know. The big sheet. This is your big sheet. Somewhere on the top, you write your names and which problem you're working on. OK, so the first thing we're going to do is we, this is called structured brainstorming, where you get post-it notes. And you're going to answer questions in one box at a time. So you can, um, I would take, we're going to do three minutes where you get post-it notes. And you write your ideas silently, as many ideas as you can write on post-it notes. And then you start collecting them yourself, in front of yourself, or you put them in the top box. And we're just thinking first about what are the specific problems you'd like to solve. Yeah, you can join here in the topic three. So what are the specific problems you're solved about your topic? So we're going to do three minutes of silence and then four minutes of sorting and collaborating on the notes. The silence is so that people who are introverted and not as loud get their ideas out. I will be timing. So let's do three minutes of silent brainstorming on the first question. Go. OK, that's enough for silence. Now you have four minutes to talk while you write. You can keep writing notes, but you can talk, you can sort. You can arrange them on the page so they make sense. You can cluster them, find repeated ideas. Talk all you want. Four minutes. <laughs> OK, let's start to think about this next question. The next question is thinking about the stakeholders in of HCI, Every, everybody who is affected by this HCI program, and obviously the students, the instructors. It could be the companies that need you when you graduate. It could be the Iowa State itself. It could be the HCI discipline. So think about any of those stakeholders and how are they affected by some of the ideas you're thinking of doing? Or how would the solving some of these problems affect those people? And those are people you might think of as, oh, I'm going to take actions on those people, short term and long term later. So first three minutes silent, then four minutes loud. OK, if you haven't moved to the. Um, you haven't moved to the solutions, we're going to start thinking about solutions, short term and long term. What are actions you can take? Or the actions that you think we should take, actions that Elliot can take or that I can take, actions that your professors can take. So again, three, you know, a couple minutes of silent brainstorming, fill in those actions, long and short term. If you're not sure about short or long, just put them where you think, and we'll figure it out. OK, if you haven't started on the talking out loud collaborative thing, this is the time for that. OK, let's wrap it up. Get your last ideas out there. Let's have your people uh, come up. We're going to hold up your poster thing, ideally, if your stickum is working. Who's going to talk? Who's going to talk over there? Dante. Dante's got, you want to, so how about the other two of you hold your poster and then he's going to talk? So everybody. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you know, then he can point at things. So bring it on up, bring it up. So get some assistance to hold while the others talk. Okay. No, OK, just wait a minute. OK. So hey, everybody, let's hear from a uh, group on topic one. What was topic one, everybody? What was topic one? Uh, it is uh, how, um, what was the topic again? Um, how can companies, industry be more involved in the HCI program? Yes, so topic one is about how can industry be more involved in the HCI program. So we started off with that problem, and all of us have brainstormed with uh, different kind of problems we came up with. And uh, some of them uh, we had written, like most of the students don't know what kind of jobs we want to look for. 
and the other one is like what kind of uh, companies would be coming in and how to handle the fear and the anxious uh, anxiousness while facing the career fair and then yeah what uh, career opportunities are there for the international students that's the main question uh, and then uh, after, uh, we also had seen that there are companies which would want to develop the uh, skills pro from the students. And then we went on with kind of coming out with the pr uh, problem solutions. So we have got many different problem solutions which we grouped them, uh, grouped them into different kinds of stakeholders. Some of them which are uh, falling under the university and the faculty, like one of them is like, university can uh, uh, talk about how they are involving the industry within the uh, to engage the students, some of them which are student focused, which uh, allow students to e experience how the industry experience is going to be like and what is going to be offered in the industry. And some of them which fall into the uh, category where industry itself is benefited by, you know, sometimes uh, when, uh, the stu uh, when the industry comes into engaging with the um, the program itself, they can easily find the students which are uh, which are uh, you know eligible or they are the great fit for the company itself. And then moving on to what actions we can all take. So there are like uh, more uh, HCI um, commitment uh, events where we can organize the events, especially for the students which are probably categorizing them into the international students and what kind of job opportunities which are required, uh, like some of them which are focusing only on the international students, some of them which can uh, focus on all of the students. That's the one of the most important thing which we were focusing on because uh, international students uh, like in the career fair were not uh, given much opportunities, so that's one of the most important things. And then filtering the job opportunities based on the career uh, fair and how in, uh, how that can benefit different kinds of the students and what kind of uh, opportunities they can, you know, uh, make use of. So those are some things that we have come up with. Thank and you. Like So our topic is topic number three, how ICU HCI improve student job placement or network networking within our community. So some problems that we've listed out is that um, there's a lack of connection within the department. Um, students, a lot of students uh, from NCI department don't know each other at all. And um, also we don't have much of a professional connection, professional networking and um, yeah, well, uh, connection with entrepreneurs and stuff like that. Uh, moving on, how would uh, solving these affect uh, solving the problems would affect the HCI stakeholders? Um, there's a lot of benefit. For example, um, the ICU HCI department would be improving its um, its uh, outlook, prestige, and there would be growth in departments, reputation, and community, which is important. Um, HCI students would get exposure outside of HCI department. Um, there could be easier recruitment for companies, which is beneficial for both companies and students. And um, companies could also tell us in advance what they're looking for uh, fr from their future employees, which is also beneficial for all three parties. Uh, moving on, so what's the short-term and long-term solutions? In terms of short-term solutions, we've got um, professors, you know, uh, to be in professors to invite speakers to classes would be <laughs> very beneficial, and um, each faculty could contact the industry partner. Also, we could contact companies to come uh, speak and connect with the students. 
also uh, organizing this sort of event where a social event where it's informational with speakers and social as well could be very ben beneficial. And also we could do uh, a short social fun event with guidance where we could work, where students could work on projects. For example, a whole one day event where all of us could learn something from one another. And we could also contact companies. Long term events uh, would be internship programs in collaboration with ISU and the companies would be extremely beneficial and advice programs for internship as well. Also create a platform or use a platform where all the ATI people could easily find one another and connect and share their profiles and stuff and build a long term collaboration with a company as well. Thank you. quitting after this. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, we did uh, prompt four, which is how to <laughs> stop laughing, which is how to <laughs> Yeah, we're good like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> we did prompt four, which is how to um, uh, encourage more HCI research. Um, we'll start off uh, over here. We um, were thinking about how could we um, identify more HCI journals um, for our students to know where we could where we could be going on a more consistent basis. Also, talking about how um, we might uh, benefit from uh, yeah. educating ISU faculty in general. There might be a lot of um, ISU faculty who are doing HCI research but not even know they're doing it. So, by educating them that, we can include them into the loop. Um, Amin had the pretty solid idea of holding our own conference. Apparently, that was a thing that used to happen, but stopped. Uh, we did not know that, so maybe that's not a great suggestion. Um, a great suggestion is a lot of work. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I had the idea. Um, we uh, I've had um, with a lot of the kids in my group. I've had um, some cool ideas where you know they've done their research but then you know there's some topics that they maybe didn't get to complete so you know if we kind of had a more formalized list of all the things that previous students wanted to do um, that were left on the table and then maybe future students could pick that up and kind of have a more um, kind of easier idea of um, idea generation for papers all right, and then how would solving these affect ISU stakeholders? Well, um, for the director and associate director, you would get more papers, and I know that makes you guys look good, so that'd be great. Um, what else? Um, yeah, it would kind of create a more streamlined process for paper generation, which again, make uh, the bosses look good, so that's always good. Um, more industry partners, again, more jobs, people get more prestigious jobs. Also makes the bosses look good, so that's good. All right, and then um, you were the one who wanted me to talk. All right, so. Um, call bosses looking good being out here. Exactly. I mean, look at me now. I never wear a collared shirt. Um, what actions can we? So short term. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to read that one. Read that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, I have more the idea of like creating like an intranet um, uh, idea where we could um, like list the conferences and journals that we've posted to in the past, so that students would have a better idea of kind of where they should be looking to go with their um, with their work. Um, just for me, I remember as an undergrad, um, you know, I come in, know nothing about it, so I don't know what CHI is, I don't know what IEEE is. So it's um, you know having that kind of list that you can just go look at and be like, oh, okay, here's what this is. Let me take a look at what that. Um, it would be helpful to kind of get everyone oriented. Um, that's, um, yeah, I'm not going to read that one. Uh, <laughs> I'm not also going to read that one. And then um, the other one was kind of creating, helping to create more of an interconnected community. It's kind of mentioned pre by some previous groups, but... Apparently, back in the day when there was $1 draft nights, um, it used to be a big group that would go there. And again, that's one of those things that 
helps everyone, you know, get together, get people talking, uh, maybe get some interconnectivity intra between groups that previously wasn't there. I mean, you know, my boy Mean is always around, so it's, um, you know, I get to meet some groups, students, but, you know, it doesn't happen as, as much as maybe we'd want, so that would be um, cool to get more of that. So, yeah, that's what uh, we had. Thank you. to do some of this extra work to help address the program. We're going to photograph this. I'm going to get them out on Miro. I also have to give out kudos to Gila for helping make these papers, and Lynn Bagley for founding the paper itself, and Steve for making all the words on the paper that were there before you got here, and for um, Ash, who was here earlier, Ash, and, uh, so it was, and Sarah. That's right. It was very collaborative, getting all this together. I um, also want to give kudos to Spencer Brawley in the back who works for IT, and he's going to get this as a nice video out for us. And thank you for being here. In exchange for being here late, you get to take home all the food, or as much food as you can carry. Uh, please take home some food. It'll go to a good cause. Otherwise, it'll be on the bar on Monday and not taste as good. OK, so thank you so much for coming out. I really value your membership in the community, and it's great to have you. Bye.